Sometimes, stories in the news make you wonder, who's making all the decisions? I mean, who's really pulling the strings? The financial crisis has been a disaster for ordinary people right across Europe. But the banks who caused the crisis carry on business as usual. Where's the regulation? There are chemicals being used that we know cause serious illnesses and contaminate the environment. Why are they still being produced when safer alternatives are out there? We need pollinating insects. A third of our food depends on them. With bee populations collapsing, why did it take the EU years to ban some of the pesticides that have been killing them? Corporate lobbyists. When you start to look, they have a hand in everything. Who are these lobbyists? And how do they get what they want? Hundreds of decisions that affect us all are made in Brussels every day. In fact, about half of all the legislation in EU countries comes from European law. The thing is, most ordinary people don't really know how these laws are made or who, in fact, is making them. We entrust three institutions with developing European law. The Commission drafts legislation and then the European Parliament and the Council, representing our national governments, tweak it and vote on it. All three are based in the so-called EU quarter of Brussels, the Brussels bubble. It would be a dangerous oversight, though, to talk about lawmaking in Brussels without mentioning some of the most influential players in the game. You see, the streets of the Brussels bubble are teeming with corporate lobbyists, all working hard to steer decisions taken here to their advantage. Lobbying in Brussels is big business, and they've got it down to a fine art. Office space isn't cheap here, but it pays to operate close to the heart of power. The Amazon electronics producer, Thales, the chemical giant BASF, Deutsche Bank, Unilever, Shell, Vattenfall, General Electric, Axie, BNY Mellon, BNY Mellon, Rolls Royce, Imperial Tobacco Group, Microsoft, British Airways, All these large corporations have their very own office dedicated to lobbying within the few square kilometres surrounding the institutions. And they're not alone. When several companies are after the same thing, weaker regulations, avoiding a ban that might hinder business, less stringent workers' rights so they can make bigger profits, They'll work together through an umbrella organisation. There are more than a thousand in Brussels representing pretty much every industry you can imagine. <clears throat> Sometimes corporations pay a public affairs consultancy or law firm to lobby the institutions on their behalf. It's a lucrative business. Burson Masler, for example, employs 60 lobbyists to influence EU decision makers for clients like Nestle, Danone and Bayer and has an annual turnover of over 8.5 million euro. An objective-looking study or report from an academic-sounding think tank can work wonders to convince a politician. Brussels hosts numerous not-so-neutral think tanks. Some are heavily dependent on corporate funding, some produce one-off reports for business in return for cash. You see, corporations lobby most effectively when the message they want to push is delivered by several, apparently independent, sources. There may be as many as 30,000 lobbyists in Brussels. That's at least one lobbyist for each person working on policy within the institutions. The majority aren't working for me and you, though. 70% are paid to influence politics for corporate interests, with literally millions of euros at their disposal and privileged access to policymakers. It's hardly a surprise that these armies of corporate lobbyists are so successful in ensuring that policies suit business interests rather than the interests of the general public. Once they've set up office where the action is, how do lobbyists actually influence decisions? When drafting new legislation, the European Commission routinely turns to external experts for advice. In fact, it's often these so-called expert groups that draft the first proposals, and big business lobbyists are all over these expert groups. When it comes to the groups advising the Commission on the financial sector, for example, industry representatives outnumber experts from academia, consumer groups and trade unions by a ratio of 4 to 1. Back in 2008, at the height of the financial crisis, the Commission set up an expert group to find solutions to the catastrophe. The group was chaired by Jacques de la Rosière, a senior figure from the financial industry. Astonishingly, four of the group's other eight members were closely linked to giant financial corporations who held a large responsibility for causing the crisis in the first place. 
So the Commission gets advice on regulating the financial sector from the financial sector. This makes it easier to explain why the financial reform after the crisis has been so woefully inadequate. The EU could, for example, have obliged banks to ensure that they're covered for the risks they take. Instead, banks are allowed to borrow even more now than Lehman Brothers did before it crashed. Unfortunately, it's pretty standard for the European Commission to take advice from experts from within the very industry the rules are aimed at. Corporate experts with a vested interest in either shaping the law or avoiding regulation altogether. How else do lobbyists make an impact? With inside knowledge of the EU and stacks of influential contacts, former Commission officials, members of Parliament and their advisers get snapped up by industry lobbies, offering them lucrative jobs as soon as they leave the institutions. And when they're done with lobbying, why not move right back into politics? The revolving door phenomenon. Let's see how it works in practice. REACH was the European Commission's ambitious proposal to create rules to protect citizens and the environment from dangerous chemicals. The idea was to require the chemical industry to demonstrate the safety of its products and to substitute chemicals of very high concern with safer alternatives. Frightened by the potential financial impact on their business, the chemical industry launched a multi-million euro campaign to kill off the REACH proposal. The corporate lobby groups started working their revolving doors, with staff moving to and from the very commission department that was writing the legislation, DG Enterprise. Its director, John Paul Mingerson, was headhunted as general advisor for lobbying giant Business Europe. Meanwhile, chemical multinational BASF was found to be funding advisors within DG Enterprise and seconded more than 200 of its staff members to the German government. A lobbyist from the German Chemical Federation, VCI, also acted as an advisor to key members of the European Parliament. All this gave big chemical corporations privileged access to political information and made it far easier to influence the decisions. Their huge lobbying campaign proved to be enormously successful. REACH entered into force in 2007, but was dramatically watered down with many loopholes allowing many of the more dangerous chemicals to remain on the market. Not every lobbying story ends that way. Take bees, for example. Bee populations in Europe have been in sharp decline, posing a real problem for our ecosystems and ultimately the food on our plates. So protecting these pollinators is essential. In 2012, British and French researchers published evidence suggesting pesticides called neonicotinoids were linked to the decline of bee colonies. The European Commission proposed a partial and temporary ban. Sure enough, two of the companies producing neonicotinoids waged an all-out lobbying war against the ban. They sent menacing letters to the EU Food Safety Authority, scaremongered about losses to agriculture, and produced biased studies. Another pesticide company, BASF, used a front group called Bees Biodiversity Network to greenwash its activities. The network, for example, co-organised an exhibition at the European Parliament, playing down the harmful role of pesticides and stressing other causes for the bees' decline. But in this particular case, the public was informed and engaged and under pressure of public opinion, politicians were finally forced to stand up to big industry. The European Commission went ahead with its proposal and a clear majority of EU countries supported it. Three of Bayer and Syngenta's pesticides, which had been linked to the decline in bees, were banned, at least temporarily. So why don't we hear more about all this lobbying influencing our laws? Well, one of the lobbyists' best weapons is secrecy. A European transparency register does exist in which groups are supposed to declare how much they spend, how many lobbyists work for them, and which issues they try to influence. But the register is still voluntary. So hundreds of companies and lobby organisations, law firms and consultancies have lobbied in the shadows, avoiding the register. Corporate lobbying happens everywhere, right? Well. Yes, but the issue is especially problematic in Brussels because a lack of expertise within the European institutions often leaves them looking for input from outside, and that input is often provided by lobbyists. Policy making in Brussels is very complex and not a topic too many people tend to get excited about. But this lack of public interest and awareness leaves lobbyists free to go about their dubious business with little scrutiny. And so it is that big business interests capture the policy agenda ensuring that European laws, time and time again, serve the interests of large corporations above those of the people of Europe. 
That is, unless those people speak out.